welcome everyone to today's to this evening's AI Swiss session. I'm happy to welcome that. Uh, thanks for joining us, Dad. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no question. Uh, I have been looking at the impressing, uh, impressive uh, style of writing and topics you cover. So it was always interesting and it was a great opportunity just to invite you today. Uh, so for everyone who has just joined, um, a quick introduction to the, the organization of this evening. Uh, you're always open to ask questions, as you know, this is typical for AI Swiss. Uh, please, you can uh, find a Q&A section in your navigation bar. So take out, there's a Q&A uh, where you can always ask and post your questions. I will look out for anything you would like to, uh, to know from, from that during his presentation. Um, I'm also going to start in a minute, uh, Paul, a quick poll. We'll learn a little bit more about you. I think we do that in the time when, when Dad is introducing himself. So he's, he's uh, doing that on his own at least for the beginning. And uh, so always feel free to ask your question. Dad, uh, I, I said it already, so you're going to introduce yourself. That's fantastic. Tell me more about you. Yeah, so uh, um, oh, what's, it, there's a quick poll. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, as I said, my, my name is Dad. I'm currently the CTO and co-founder of PriceLoop. Uh, I'm doing this together with uh, Dr. Richard Schwenke. We are building um, AI software as a service firmware, um, a company uh, that is doing pricing. And before that, I used to head the uh, AI um, department at Axel Springer, uh, one of the biggest uh, media company here in Europe. And before Axel Springer, I was already also in the group. So I was heading the data team at uh, Idealo. Um, and uh, yeah, so looking forward for today. And uh, should I start with the uh, talk already or? No, not with your talk, just a little bit about you. But that's interesting. So you, you have a pretty large range of expertise from your past. Uh, you're talking about computer vision this evening, right? Yeah. Uh, so this, this computer vision thing you're explaining here at the moment, it goes back to Idealo or to, to Axel Springer? Yeah, so this topic goes back to what we did at uh, Idealo. Um, at Idealo, we were mainly focused a lot on computer vision topics. Uh, uh, and uh, so you might ask the question, uh, why? So Idealo well, I, is, a, is a, if you're not aware of this, it's a very big price comparison website. And uh, um, they, of course, have a product catalog, right? And, you know, if you're looking at products, you have a lot of, of pictures, right? And uh, um, here are self the question we, um, of course, you know, like image aesthetic or beauty or any anything related to a computer vision is is interesting for these kind of companies because, uh, of course, Idealo doesn't have only one product, right? But they have millions of products or millions of uh, um, okay. They also do hotels. They price comparison for hotels for airlines as, for for aviation as well, right? And if you think about that, right? Uh, this wide range of data, um, you know, you cannot just do it manually, right? So you need an algorithm to handle this kind of things. Yeah. What I find interesting about you is that you also had always the chance to build up teams, which seems to be an awesome job. So uh, you build a team at Diado, I guess, and uh, Axel Springer as well. Yeah, uh, I, I had the, I, I would say the, the big luck uh to to get a certain budget uh at a at a at a actually at a very young age for my from in my case actually to to build up a team from scratch because i believe that you know uh, at the time uh i could do it better <laughs> right i could i could gather a team together that was would do something uh the right way i would say right because there's no right and wrong but maybe like the right way for my case right um with my thinking and also um basically the direction of of uh, of uh you know what i chose right because um you know he, here especially in europe we really weren't much focused on open source right uh and we really weren't focused on you know sharing our results and basically uh discussing it with with other peers and i think i i started it pretty early uh here especially in, in germany for um especially for berlin as well right um, and I think that's why Diallo still got attraction in machine learning these days. Okay, cool. Uh, that's quite interesting um, because you're just working at a startup again, right? So the price loop. Yeah. And you have yeah. to build up a team again, no? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's very exciting because uh, now I'm not only like, you know, taking care of uh, AI related topics, but, you know, uh, like the whole entire engineering uh, part, of course, uh, but then also, of course, uh, building up a business, right? So, uh, of course, uh, at, in my time at Diallo or at Axel Springer, I was mainly focused on the, like, you know, hiring a specific part of engineering, right? <clears throat> but of course, um, I was also involved into uh, like, you know, uh, other related stuff in engineering, like uh, DevOps, <clears throat> also building um, production ready related uh, stuff, right? But uh, uh, now, you know, it's, it's, it's much more wide range of topics that I need to take care of, like, you know, from security to front end, to design, uh, to the product, uh, to finance. <laughs> uh, so there's many, many uh, dimensions that uh, uh, need to be t- taken care of, but I'm really excited. So I have a very uh, strong co-founder next to me. He already uh, co-founded Contorion. I uh, did a, an amazing exit uh, a couple of years ago, a very business and product uh, focus. So we basically, you know, uh, we both of us uh, have a really good kind of like coverage of, of a variety of topics. Interesting. Um, if you, now that you have that experience of building up an AI based company, uh, what do you think is the best mix in the beginning? So from the, from the team's uh, team perspective, what kind of skills, what kind of roles uh, should an AI-based company start with? I mean, I mean, uh, the question is, uh, uh, are you building an algorithm or are you building software, right? So we are, of course, uh, at the beginning, we are building software. That means uh, we either have machine learning engineers, right? We have a strong focus on how, how to know how to build software, right? Um, <clears throat> and then also software engineers. Um, um, at the moment, we don't have this... Um, research specific people, you know, who just do research, right? So it's more uh, driven to uh, software at the moment. So coding skills. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so uh, the poll has been closed. You probably have noticed that, but the poll is closing. Uh, here's the results. So I was asking, what is your profession? So 43% say data scientists. We have 21% software engineers and architects together. Uh, we have even consultants, 29% and 10% product managers. I think it's a good mix. Mm-hmm. And looking at the skill level, uh, we have people with just beginning, they are novice, uh, 29%, so good, uh, 30% basically, yes. Uh, 57% are advanced. So if you take care of that mix, I think we're just getting getting uh, well across this, this evening. <coughs> okay, uh, so far, the poll. Now it's your stage that I'm, I'm really looking forward to a presentation and what you have to tell us about beautiful, uh, uh, the beautiful and, and pictures and images. Right? Okay. Okay. Shall I close the poll here or? Uh... No, you can start whatever you want. Okay. Okay. Because okay. the poll was showing, showing me on, on Zoom. So, okay. So uh, coming to my topic, um, as I said, I was uh, uh, the head of data at uh, Idealo and at Idealo we work a lot on computer vision projects. And this is basically uh, the output of one of the projects that we've been working on. And today I would like to show you why it was important, right? And what kind of approaches we took basically to solve the problem. Um, You can see my screen, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't don't need to introduce myself again. So we're just uh, gonna skip that part, but maybe this is important. So uh, we worked on a, a wide range of projects uh, from computer vision, but also to uh, voice topics. <clears throat> if you are interested in two projects, you can check out like ai.axelspringer.com. So there are many of our projects there. Um, and if you find it interesting, um, yeah, this is also not uh, necessary to show anymore. Uh, I still write a lot of code. So um, also at the company, we are committed to do open source. So uh, expect to have some open source from, from my side as well in the future. So if you're interested, you can follow me on GitHub. Uh, but also I, uh, I'm not writing so much anymore uh, because due to time constraint and uh, capacity, but uh, there's still some of my articles on Medium. So you have the link to your GitHub repository somewhere? Or- yeah, uh, it's it's just Dati Tron is my username, so uh, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. So this is the agenda for today. So I'm going to give a short motivation 
uh, why we did that project. So I'm going to then I'm going to talk about uh, the problem itself, uh, and then sh show one of the use cases where we applied that, and then uh, give a, a conclusion. Okay. So concerning motivation, as I said, I was working for Axel Springer. So Build is is one of the uh, premier flagship. Um, like a tabloid paper of of uh, of the of Axel Springer, and basically Axel Springer, as I said, is one of the Europe's leading digital publisher. Um, has uh, around sixty thousand employees worldwide, and it's it's basically uh, in in many many countries uh, available. Um, and um, some of the brands you might be aware of. I mean, in Switzerland, uh, Axel Springer has this uh, kind of like uh, cooperation with. Um, Oh, I forgot the company, uh, uh, Springer. Uh, uh, oh, forgot it, but some, something with Springer as well. Ringier. It's Ringier in Switzerland. Ah, Ringier, yeah, Ringier. And uh, basically, uh, within Axel Springer, uh, one company that is also part of the Axel Springer group is Idealo, right? And uh, Idealo, as I said already, is, uh, is a price comparison website. It's now like 20 years old. And um, what they do is they do price comparison <clears throat> for like, you know, electronic products, right? Like guide sites or any other um, price comparison that you can think of. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and basically they also do a price and comparison for flights, but hotel and so on, right? So it's not only for e-commerce products. <clears throat> we are more, 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 we are mainly interested into the hotel pricing comparison. And um, uh, because uh, this was one of the biggest problems that they face. Uh, and at Idealo, what they do is, um, I mean, of course, when you like go to travel, right, you look for hotels, and then you basically type in the city that you want to go to and the date that you are, that you pick, right, where you want to stay. Uh, typically, what you can find also on uh, other platforms like TripAdvisor or Booking.com. <clears throat> um, what happens here is, um, at Idealo, they have, of course, similar to other platforms, they have a lot of accommodations. So they have around 2.3 million accommodations. Uh, out of this accommodation, they have like 300 million images. And if you divide it by this accommodation, <clears throat> you have 133 images per accommodation. <clears throat> um, so, but the, the question that we might ask is, oh, I need to some water. <laughs> Definitely. It's important, it's fine that. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> I should speak yeah, slow. Everybody should take some water, have some water. <laughs> I have apple juice basically, so to keep my my tank fresh. Let me, open, let me open my room here. And yeah, just, sure. why this is so hot. I have no air in here. <laughs> With everyone locked in and during Corona <laughs> times, you need to find a more healthy work. Yeah. Place, right? Yeah. Okay. So coming back to um, this topic, so why is uh, photography important, right? So if you travel, you usually, you know, there's two things that are very important. I think one thing is the price, right? So you want to have a certain budget and also, of course, the photo, because the photo is something that you look at in the image, right? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's true. I, if, if I did, I work for this <laughs> basically in the past, which is tourist portal. And yes, uh, definitely it's a key, key thing for people to decisions based on, on images. So it's really important, yes. Right. Um, and when you look at go to Idealo though, so this is an uh, output from Berlin. So you type in Berlin, you see uh, this year, right? Uh, but the problem is uh, it, this is not really nice as a first image, right? I mean, that might be nice for some people, but I would not really click on this image, right? And um, for me, like from my perspective, I think that most of my generation, so I'm 32 now, is like a tunnel generation. So basically, uh, you know, you swipe left or right in a sense of way, right? And it's also for the internet, right? Because if you're on the internet, uh, if it's something you're nice, you really click away and then, you know, you don't really look at that. Um, of course, when you click further, you have a gallery, right? Um, like, you know, on images, because it's not only one image. But here you can also see something very particular. So the, the image placement. So for this case, uh, on the position one, you have a bedroom here. And then on the position 19, you have this bedroom. Uh, from my perspective, I believe that position 19 looks much better. Yeah, for my, for well. <clears throat> when, we look further, when we look further, we have reception, um, position three and position 17. Uh, here again, I mean, this is subjective, right? Uh, subjective is a very uh, important thing. 
I also believe that 17 looks better than, than, than three, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, then another thing, so one thing that we can agree on, so beautiful images uh, should appear early in the gallery, right? So this is uh, one of the hypotheses that we say, a statement that we say that should be the case. Um, the second case is uh, something, uh, other, not, another important uh, thing. So uh, when you look at all the images, I give you 10 seconds, what do you think is uh, similar or on, on this gallery? A lot of beds. <laughs> Right. So basically, 80% of these are bedrooms, right? So uh, we can agree. The next point is we have to ensure that different areas get depicted, right? Um, uh, why is it important? Well, um, you know, as a platform, um, you want to kind of personalize, right? To give, give your, your users a, like a personalized experience. Um, and basically, it would be good that you basically categorize your pictures according to certain groups, like bedrooms, bathrooms, restaurant, face it, uh, fitness studio, kitchen, and so on, right? So this is like an example of some categories that we have. Um, why is it important? Because for example, if you're a business user, right, uh, you want to probably see different categories than for example, like a tourist, right? Or like a, like someone who's just driving privately. Um, and in this case, basically, uh, this really helps to kind of like um, make sure that you have this kind of uh, customer experience. So uh, at the end of the day, we have a, uh, two problems, right? Uh, from the machine learning perspective. So one problem is we just want to classify the hotel with images with the right uh, category, right? And yeah. second thing is we want to predict an aesthetic quality. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, all those two problems. I only talk about the second problem. Uh, why? Because uh, it's very cool, right? And it's very it's more interesting than uh, image classification. And for this kind of problem, we are using uh, deep learning to solve the problem. Uh, why deep learning? Well, because uh, this is a state of the art learning at the moment. Right? Okay. Um, and then of course, um, within access, so one another reason why we built this system is uh, it was not also important for Idealo, but also another daughter companies that we had at Axel Springer. So this is a listing from uh, Immunet. Um, this is another Axel Springer company where you can basically find uh, real estates right uh, and you can see like you know the first image is uh, also not very nice right so basically if you have a ordering there as well that would also help other services within the company okay let's um so we gave a short motivation why it's important now let's dig deep uh, dig deeper into image aesthetic <clears throat> so what is the image aesthetic um this is a definition that i took from wikipedia um, it's basically a branch of, uh, uh, of philosophy dealing with the nature of beauty and taste and with the creation and appreciation of uh, beauty, right? Uh, sounds very abstract, but we're going to go deeper into, uh, you know, what you can define as beauty, right? Um, a simple case uh, that you would do is basically, you know, you would um, have two pictures and then, you know, you ask people what looks more beautiful, right? And then people will give you, you know, kind of like an opinion on that. Uh, in this case, you know, I, I'm just showing you like two pictures, right? Um, you can choose what picture would you think is beautiful. Uh, I, I, in my case, think the left picture, uh, the, the left image is beautiful, right? Uh, versus the right image. But sometimes people also say that the right image is beautiful, right? So you, there's no really right and wrong uh, in, in this case, right? And really, you know, uh, remember that for beauty, like for beauty, there's not really right and wrong. There's only a score that you could give, right? From each perspective of a user. So um, a static score, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> okay, Similar to that uh, uh, example, so uh, left and right, right? One can say the right image it has a filter, it's blurry. The left image is, is much better, right? But <clears throat> it doesn't matter, you know, it's very subjective. <clears throat> Similar to that, I give you two images, right? Left and right, and you still, uh, I don't know which of these images would look better. <clears throat> All right. In terms of aesthetic, there are two dimensions. So there's <clears throat> there's an aesthetic dimension and there's a technical quality. So if you look at the aesthetic, there's, um, oh, give me a second. <sighs> I mean, you already made me quite curious about what you're trying to develop here because uh, from aesthetics to mathematics, that's, that would be interesting. <laughs> How can aesthetic be mathematical uh, expressed? 
and there's not much air in my room. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> what a pity. So in terms of dimension, there are two dimensions. So you have the aesthetic dimensions and you have the tech equality uh, dimensions. Um, the aesthetic dimensions look really more like at angles, uh, objects, and colors, right? And the tech equality looks more at um, fluidness, noise, and lights. Um, oh, I drink some water. <laughs> okay, these, these seem to be all observable variables like angle, objects, colors. Um, <laughs> the rest is also technically uh, feasible to, to ex expect from pictures, right? Yeah, right. So, in terms of like technical quality, um, is something that is easier to understand, so it's less subjective, right? Because because blurriness, noise, and lights is uh, something that that you know you 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 can understand that right. So you have a, like the level of blurriness, the level of noise, and level of lights, right? Uh, but for aesthetic, um, this is more subjective because uh, an image which looks much better or not better, like in terms of your angle or your objects or colors, right, is something that is really really hard to understand. Um, and um, basically. Um, this algorithm that we use can uh, predict both aesthetic and technical quality, but we rather focus today only on the aesthetic. <clears throat> okay, as I said already, isn't beauty uh, subjective? Uh, of course, it's subjective, um, but the question is, can we capture the subjectiveness uh, somehow, right? In, in, a, in a score or in a mathematical way. Um, a naive approach would be, we give uh, two images, right? A good and bad one, um, and we could, basically you know um have give it to people and they would label this right here in this case it's a binary classification and we label them good and bad right <clears throat> then we would uh, put them into like a like a neural network like a convolutional neural network right um and then basically output good and bad at the end of the day the problem with this solution is uh how much data do we actually need to train this model right so you <clears throat> you basically need a lot of data and the question is how many combination of good and bad um, do we need to do to, to have this kind of problem? Because uh, if you think about this combination, right, you have to add another picture, another picture, right, and add many, 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 many pictures, and the complexity is very, very high. Then, of course, you have uh, is good and bad enough? Because usually in a production system, you don't really just use good and bad, right? Because show all the good images and show all the bad images. This is something that is not really nice because usually you have a gallery, right? And you want to have a like a numerical ordering, right? So that's why uh, two classes are not really uh, feasible, uh, uh, kind of like good for a production ready system. Um, and then the other problem is how many models uh, do you actually want to create, right? So I told you, you need a lot of combinations and you need a lot of models basically to have it run. And then like, okay, basically you need a lot of rules as well on top of this, because usually you have a model and then here you have business logic, right? And this business logic is really, really a lot. And then the other question, question is, does it really capture subjectiveness, right? So I told you that um, uh, beauty is subjective, right? So someone could say, um, the left image is bad, right? And the right image is good, but there's no score that would say, okay, the, the, the good image, the, the left image is, is actually uh, good, right? And some other will say it's bad. So it's, it's really uh, difficult because if you have just good and bad, it's one and zero, right? So uh, of course you have a, a naive approach would be to sum up the good and bad, right? But then you end up maybe with zero or with one and you still don't know whether it's a good or bad image. <clears throat> Another solution that um, um, Expedia took um, was basically also pretty interesting. So what they did is they uh, collected uh, 100,000 images. They used Amazon Mechanical Turk to um, label these images and um, a rating from one to 10. <clears throat> and then they took um, like an average of these uh, six images, right? And then averaged them. And then they uh, put them in the convolutional neural network, right? Uh, and then replace the dense layer with um, with um, mean screen error loss, right? And then have basically one score. Um, the problem with this approach is though, is now they get only one score, right? So they don't really capture, you know, like a distribution of images. As I said, um, we want to capture subjectiveness, right? So we want to kind of like know, okay, someone said this image is good. Someone said this image is not good, right? And we want to know like how far away are our prediction from that. 
Okay, let me uh, close the door. <laughs> now it's very cold. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Another solution that um, um, was what we also looked at was uh, provided by IM. And what they just did is they use hinge loss for that. So given three images, so these three images, what you basically do is um, you uh, calculate uh, distance functions, right? Uh, and then compare each triplets to each other. So you compare you know, the first image to the third image, you compare the first image to the second image, right? And then basically you do, do some ordering and decide which of the images is closer to each other, right? Um, I mean, this is uh, pretty standard because usually like a triplet hinge loss is also used to, to find uh, duplicates, right? So basically, you know, in, in a neural network, you try to find an embedding, right? So that basically uh, images that are closer to each other basically have a, a closer score, right? Versus images that are further apart uh, basically are, um, um, uh, are not close to the, like the, to the, to the source image. Yeah. Um, and what they did is they have three uh, separate neural networks. It was VGG11, uh, and they pass these three uh, images to the network, right? And then at the end of the day, they uh, summarize the triplet hinge loss, and then basically use the similarity function to compare with each other. Um, if you if you look at the naive approach, right, or think like go back to the naive approach before, it's it's a very similar approach, basically. But of course, here in this case, you have uh, instead of two, you have three, um, uh, three images, and basically you are using the triple hinge loss to calculate the distances, right? So uh, at the end of the day, there is some kind of subjective uh, captured in the hinge loss, but of course, the problem with the complexity is still high because you still need to compare a lot of triplets to each other. So it's not computationally not uh, like a very good approach, right, uh, for training. Um, but also a lot in production, uh, it is not a very nice approach when you think about uh, using this uh, in production as well. Yeah. Um, our solution or what we did at the end uh, is um, we actually found this very nice Google paper. It's called a neural image assessment, um, which was published in 2017. And it actually uh, also, it's not like uh, novel, but the novel paper that is actually coming from, from uh, two Harvard students or like a Harvard student, right? Where they basically uh, talk about uh, um, um, uh, the the score, the earth mover distance that we use um, to uh, for this uh, problem. And I'm gonna go deeper into this topic uh, more. Uh, and basically this model was trained to, to, to um, predict uh, aesthetic model and also a technical model. Um, in our problem, what we also used was um, called transfer learning. I think many, many of you are probably uh, are aware of this. Um, so what we did is we used a pre-trained convolutional network that was trained on uh, ImageNet, right? And uh, we replaced the top layers uh, with our problem. And then we trained the existing uh, new layers again. Um, um, this, so the reason why you use transfer learning is, is very trivial, right? Um, um, it's basically to save computational power because uh, this problem was already trained to detect objects, right? And basically, if you train it on objects already, you're saving a lot of time because then our network doesn't need to learn uh, what a human looks like or what an animal looks like. Um, this is the training regime. So basically, um, what we also did is we first we added the, uh, uh, like, you know, we used transfer learning, then we added the new added a dense layer with a high learning rate, um, and then we trained all layers with a low learning rate. Um, so the reason why we are doing this is, is very trivial. So um, I'm gonna show you it. Um, so this is a curve that we want to optimize for, right? Um, and if you have a sm le small learning rate that is too high, uh, too low, right? Um, then it, it would take us very long to converge for the problem, right? Can you see my mouse actually? Yeah, that's really yeah. good. Yeah, and if if it's uh, too high, right, that could mean that you basically, let's say, uh, this is a convex problem, right, but uh, you could just jump around, right, and you would never basically find the global uh, minimum, and that would be also problematic. And, uh, we basically want to have an optimal rate, right, also uh, not 
would take us too long to basically find this uh, uh, this problem, this solution. Um, another solution that uh, people uh, or other people also did was to use our atoms. It's a recified atoms, and um, basically here you don't really need to think about the learning rate, right? So it's very insensitive to to the optimizer that you're using, and basically uh, you could do it as well, but we really we, we didn't use it, so we 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 instead we use warm up uh, to solve this problem. Um, so this is our learning curve. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into that. I mean, I just want to show you. Uh, we of course we did a, a split into train loss. Um, as you can see, this is where we only trained the dense layer with a high learning rate, right? Uh, and then we lowered the learning rate because we didn't want it to juggle with the like uh, pre-trained weights, right? Because you know, uh, if if it, it, the machine already learned what a human is, you know, you don't want to move it away from that, but you know, just you know, in a direction so that it uh, more changes to like towards aesthetic, right? And uh, making that kind of judgment. Um, Another important um, factor is uh, usually in an image classification problem or many computer vision problem, you probably heard of cross entropy loss, right? So this is like the typical loss function that people use uh, as a loss function. Um, but in our case, we use another loss function, where, which is called the earth mover distance. And this is also the novel uh, kind of approach on like the paper by Google, but actually borrowed from the ideas by uh, some Harvard students. Um, and so I want to just give you an, um, like a motivation why uh, earth mover distance is so important uh, and why we should not use cross entropy loss. So this is a picture of, uh, you probably heard of him, Justin Bieber, right? And uh, a typical problem what we could do is uh, let's assign him to some age group, right? So he either could be a baby, he could be a young adult, he could be middle age, okay, he could be older adult, right? In, in a, in a um, category problem, right? What you could do is you could use cross entropy loss, right? And then assign him to some, some uh, age group, right? So basically he's a young adult, right? This is his true label. Uh, in a neural network, what would you do is you would uh, kind of like do a random, like, you know, you set up some random weights and just uh, like define him to some uh, like label, right? And then basically the networks, uh, uh, do a forward propagation, right? Learns, oh, this is wrong. I do the backward propagation, you know, and then I adapt my optimal weight to that, right? And he would give me a younger diet. Um, cross entropy loss is 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 basically the case of what you do there, right? So basically, you have the true labels, right? And then you have the predicted labels, and then you know, doing the forward and back, uh, the forward and backward propagation, basically it adapts. Uh, um, your loss function in some way, right, uh, in your weights, so that it basically uh, tells you at the end of the day you are young adult. If you look at the uh, distribution now, right, so basically at the end of the day you get a distribution, um, so you you get a your function, you do softmax, right, and then you get uh, a distribution. Uh, in this case, you could get like you know two separate distribution because you know it depends on your. Uh, of course, uh, uh, on, on your random settings, but then also at the end of the day, uh, how much data and the labels you get, right? But here in this case, let's say you have two distributions. Uh, so this one says you, he's 10% a baby, he's 30% a young adult, he's 20% a middle-aged adult, and he is 40% uh, an older adult, right? Uh, in the other case, he's a baby with 40%, he's 30% a young adult, he's 20% a middle-aged adult, and he's 10% uh, an older adult, right? Um, of, we already know that he's a young adult, uh, and we assigned thirty percent, of course, in the case, right? Uh, when when you would choose prediction A, he would say that he's an older adult with forty percent, and prediction B would say he's with forty percent, he's a baby. But we know that he's he's a young adult in the way, right? So it's it's just a it's just an example uh, how this would uh, how how the distribution could be, you know, at the end of uh, your uh, your estimation. In a softmax, right? Uh, in a in a cross entropy loss, he would not really care about that that he's only ten percent, like here in this case, a baby, right? Uh, you would always say that he is uh, forty percent. He's an older adult, right? So we really don't really care about that. He is only ten percent a baby, right? Uh, whereas you know, in cross entropy loss. Uh, um, you should, uh, in, in, in earth mover distance, you really care that he is 40% a baby, right? Because someone who is a young adult, 
is closer to a baby, right? So a young adult is not closer to an old adult. So you basically, the ordering is important, right? Because if you, if we would sum up the loss here, we would get the same cross antibody loss, right? So it's basically, if you sum up these loss here, you will end up with the same loss, but this is uh, not what we want because at the end of the day, when you have subjectiveness, right? You really want to have some ordering. So you wanna, you wanna say at the end of the day that let's say, uh, you don't have baby, young adult, or middle-aged adult, or old adult. You have like a score of one, two, three, four, five, whatever, right? And you want to tell that at the end of the day, a two is closer to one than to 10, right? Because 10 is like, for example, very good looking, right? And two is very bad looking, right? And then you want to really say that two is closer to one instead of to 10. So just a quick question. So you, you tell the, the model, uh, the, the order of the classes or who's telling the model? The order. Uh, the order is something that you set by you know by the data that you collect, right? Mm -hmm. So so in 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 cross entropy loss, you don't really care about the distribution because the distribution will just take the arcmax of this function, right, and yeah. give you like you know uh, this is the final uh, category that we predicted, right? But in in uh, earth mover distance, you the prediction you know, is, is basically the distribution that you want to predict tomorrow, right? So you're predicting a distribution instead of only like uh, one, one point in the distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, did you use, um, just, just to repeat, uh, you said you, you actually used the existing image, uh, image libraries, right? Or is it, did you train it on the library you had at the Arlo's of 300 million images? And for our for for this case, what we open source, uh, we use it on on uh, open source data set that uh, um, was uh, so the Ava data set, which was provided by a photo community. Uh, but of course, for the problems that we've used on Idealo it was also, of course, on our data. Right? Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go deeper into that as well. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me continue. Um, as you can see, uh, and from my from my uh, from the last slide, cross entropy loss doesn't really care about the interclass relationships, right? And that's actually uh, really important. That's why we need a different loss function, and that's why we use uh, Earth mover distance, or it's called uh, Wasserstein metric. <laughs> so, what is a uh, um, Earth mover distance? So, Earth mover distance is defined as the minimum cost to transport um, right, uh, the mass of one distribution to to the other. Um, mm -hmm. And how does it work? So let's say you have two distribution, distribution A, A, and you have distribution and distribution C, right? And um, the question is now um, from the definition is what would it, it cost us to move distribution B to distribution A versus distribution C to distribution A, right? And in this case, uh, it was, would take us more to move B to A than C to A, right? Because you know, from C, you just need to move two to one, and here B to move, move five from one. If you if you think about that, right? In uh, in um, string matching, we have a similar distance, like you know, added distance. It's a it's kind of a similar approach, but here it is like for distribution. Okay, um, as we already know, um, at more distance takes care of order classes, right? Uh, and that is no maybe better than than regression because uh, Expedia already used regression, right? Which give us one point basically uh, in a in a certain distribution, and that's what we don't want. And uh, and that's that's why it is better to move a distance like uh, uh, like a loss function like Earth move distance. Um, this is a short um, kind of like overview of our GPU training. So we use AWS for that. Basically, what we did is we have a Docker file that. Uh, we push to an, a container registry, right? Um, and then for the training, we have a Docker machine that we spin up on the uh, P2 instance on EC2. It was copying existing uh, training uh, model from S3 and then also stored the model on S3. And then for the deviation, uh, we also used Docker machine at that time um, and then uh, launched a Jupyter notebook to do some eva evaluation. Of course, this is a very old, uh, old fashioned now. So these days, people would not just do a Docker machine. There's many things how to, you would structure that now, right? So instead of Docker machine, you probably would use Terraform, right? To spin up your C2 machine um, yeah, and also doing some stuff with Jupyter Notebook as well. So 
let's have a look at uh, how we applied um, our solution on hotel.idealo. Okay, have a short, let's have a short recap on the aesthetic problem. So <clears throat> as I said, um, this is one of the listing at uh, Idealo. And what happens is uh, this is a real listing and this is the first image. And these are like, you know, uh, three images basically that you have in the gallery, right? Um, of course, the first image is not so bad, but actually in our case, we would prefer to have this image, right? Because it looks much better. Um, in our case, we for this project, we've gone through two iterations of the project. So it took us basically 12 weeks to basically from, from the first model to the uh, to the deployment, right? And then actually after this, another six months before it actually went into production, because there's many backend changes that you still need to do, right? Um, and uh, and so on. Um, in terms of first iteration, as I always said, we use this open source data set. This is called Ava data set, um, um, which is uh, like um, a, a, a data set provided by a community, a full community. And what happens is they, outsource, um, open source this um, uh, a couple of thousands images, right? Uh, over, I think over 100,000. And then basically um, uh, people in the photo community gave like a rating from one to 10, right? So one is very bad and 10 is really good. Um, and in the second iteration, we basically fine tune our model that we train on the first iteration on some in-house label data. And I'm gonna talk about uh, in, a, in a little bit why we needed to do that. <clears throat> okay. so. For the neural images model, we actually uh, needed to do some uh, pre-processing to get the probability distribution. But uh, what happens is uh, basically you have these images, right? And then basically you have a rating, right? So like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, from one to 10, one is very um, bad, right? And 10 is very good. So, and this is really good because you, instead of having one point, right? So basically one, one person just say, you know, this image is a five, right? You have like 10 people, or many people saying, okay, this, this picture is a five, this picture is a six, this picture is seven, right? So you basically capture subjectiveness in a, in a distribution, right? Instead of only one point uh, in the distribution. Um, so this is the results of our first model. So we use a mobile net, by the way, for, as a, as a final um, uh, model, because um, the, we, as I said, we had 300 million images. And if we use something like VG16 or any other larger model like ResNet, you know, it, it would, it has a lot of complexity, right? So that's why we um, reduce our model to mobile net um, so that we can predict all the 300 images in a, in a, in a efficient time. Um, as you can see, this is the output from our first iteration. So the left one shows the expected mean and the predicted means, right? So um, the expected means is like, you know, like from one to nine and our predicted means is very close only to three to six, right? And you can see also see, you know, if you have a distribution, you can also calculate a standard deviation. And here you can see that um, the predicted standard deviation here is, is uh, not very close to the expected standard deviation, right? But if you look at these uh, images before, right? Um, you can see that you know the, the, the true distribution uh, is actually only between three to nine, uh, like three to eight, actually. So if you if you look at the Ava data set, right, the Ava data set doesn't really know that there's a lot of tens and a lot of ones, right. So that means that if you train a model, right, that is uh, publicly trained on a on a on a on a public data set, right, an open data set. Um, you actually training a model that is bound by by its uh, out input, right? So that's why in machine learning, you know, having the right data and understanding your data is really really important, right? So that means, uh, of course, uh, if you have some prediction that you have on your data, it cannot go further because most of the uh, data that you train are actually only um, close to three and six, right? So that's why the model makes pretty sense. Um, of course, despite that, we tried it on our uh, images. So this is uh, like, you know, we trained the model on this public data set, and then we tried it on uh, our own data set. Um, and basically this is a score that you can see. So for uh, bathrooms, uh, for uh, bedrooms, and you can see that the first image is actually quite good, right? Versus the last one. So you actually, um, even though the model is not, you know, capturing like the distribution and so on, 
it's actually doing a good job in understanding aesthetic, right? Um, but of course, you, one thing you can also already see that the rating 4.9 versus the last rating 4.0, um, there's not a lot of di discrimination, right? And this is very important because in a production system, you actually want to have discrimination. So you want to have like, like for example, this image should be a seven, right? Versus this image is a, like a two, right? Because if you are too close in terms of like ratings, uh, you, you know, you cannot have a, you can't have a, uh, like a adequate business logic on top of this. Um, similar to, to, to uh, bathrooms. So the first image is really nice, right? Uh, and the last room is is not uh, very good, but of course here you can still see that the discriminatory power of this uh, is this model is not really really good. Um, then we also applied it on real listings. So as you can see, you know the this uh, first listing is not really nice, but the model that we that you know uh, predicted uh, as a first image uh, is also not really nice, right? Because this is just a snapshot of. I think the balcony, uh, but of course, as, as I told you, uh, this model was trained on a public data set, right? So you have food, you have, uh, I don't know, a garden and so on, right? And maybe people said that a garden looks nicer than, for example, a bedroom or something else, right? Um, then this is another example. So here in this case, it, it found the image that we wanted, right? Uh, as, a, as a best image, but uh, you know, still the discriminatory power was not really good. Um, and here's another example, very, actually a very interesting example because the first image is really, really not nice, uh, but it also found an image that is also very, not, not very nice. Uh, um, so that's, that's, that's why, you know, um, you know, of course we could not take this model into production, but, and also we didn't expect that because, you know, um, many people, they, uh, still think that machine learning, you know, is a holy grail. You just take some some public data set, right, and then run it through, and hopefully it will come out, something out because you just use deep learning, right? But this is not the case, of course. Um, but it was good that we did it because uh, from the first results we could learn. Okay, it's not good to uh, this model is not good enough, right? Uh, we need to collect more domain specific data to make it better, right? And then also, of course, doing our first iteration, so it was really really fast. We learned that. Okay, uh, uh, you know, using uh, VGG16 is not uh, feasible, right? So we have to use MobileNet. Otherwise, we would wait six months before our first iteration would basically get all the prediction of the scores. Okay, what we did then is uh, we built a very simple labeling application. I think it took us like one day to to build this. Uh, we deployed it to to uh, people across uh, different teams at Idealo. Uh, and then they basically start collecting data, right? So labeling data. Uh, actually, it was funny because it was actually the first time that that people at Idealo had to kind of label data, right, for machine learning. So they didn't really, like, you know, uh, seen that, right? Because usually, um, when companies hire machine learning like teams, right, or build up machine learning, they never think about like you know how to collect the data or how to clean the data, but mostly, uh, most of the time is they have this high expectation. Oh, the machine learner or the data scientist comes in, right, and then you know we'll do some some magic, and then something comes out. But they just don't know that there's a lot of hard work before you really you know create a very very nice model. Um, and what we did then is we we fine tuned this model on on this labeled data, right, and this is the results of our second iteration. So you can see. Our model is doing pretty well now. So uh, basically, the expected means uh, is covered by our model, right? So it already captures, like you know, the lower and the higher scores now, and also the uh, distribution is more uh, centered, right? So basically, uh, it, it's it's something that we really wanted to have. Um, as you can see, we then we also pass it through some some examples before. So this is the same same example as before for bedrooms. Um, you can see that, but now there's a discrimin higher discriminatory power, right? So you can see that the first image um, is uh, has a good score, right? Versus uh, like the, the 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 lowest image, right? So this is really good because on top of this, you can put a nice business logic, similar to that, right? For uh, for uh, for bathrooms, right? So you can see um, still similar image, right? But uh, with a much higher score. Um, this is more interesting. So for these examples, so before, in this example before, we had this balcony, if you remember, right? Now he basically have this 
nice uh, living room, right, with a nice score. And even though he also now predicted uh, a balcony, he predicted a much better balcony angle, right? So this is this is really really nice. Similar to that example, so it's still that uh, image as a first image, but now with a much better higher rating than uh, the lowest image. Um, and here we had. This was actually really cool for us. So this was like, you know, the first listing from that hotel. And now he, like, you know, the model predicted a very, very nice first image, right? Uh, that we uh, could use basically for our production ready system. Um, so I, I just gave, you know, like, you know, how we applied it on, on um, like the hotel uh, uh, domain from Idealo, right? But of course um, at my team, we also didn't really like not only wanted to understand like you know what kind of approach would work well on this kind of a problem but we also wanted to understand you know at the time uh, why is the model working so well right and actually at that time it was really new for some team to understand the model decisions and of course we looked at that um, and a typical um, like um, uh, um approach that you can do is to visualize the convolutional filters right so what happens in 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 deep learning right what we'll do is we usually use uh, convolutional neural networks right and these convolutional neural networks have filter maps right and the filter maps basically are the trained weights that basically uh give us a judgment at the end of the day of our prediction right and basically um if you if you for example look at the different filter maps right you will see different details what of how the model basically uh, like is looking at so that we basically are doing a certain like uh, um like uh, judgment of the model right um because because um, when you think about neural networks right so neural networks like every of the neurons that you take is actually like a, a, a um, differentiable to 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 basically its neural right and basically what you can do is you can take any point of uh, in the filter map, right? Um, then take the derivative of it uh, to to its input, right? And then see what actually the neural would activate to, right? And the like the filter, like the neural activation would just show us like why did that neuron activates and came to the conclusion that the output is that certain amount, right? And this is usually when you think about image classification. Uh, a filter map is uh, actually really nice because in image classification, you know, it's it's very easy to understand what actually the the filter would look at, right? So, for example, if you look at the human, so each filter would, for example, look at certain you know like details, right? And this is an example for that. Um, so, for example, here we are looking at a car, right? In a low level feature, you know, it it might only look you know at some certain patches at the car, right? Maybe like, you know, it's yellow, da, 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 right? And then when it goes higher, it would look at objects, you know, maybe at uh, at some tires, right? Or at the engine or at the window and so on, right? And, and if you combine these, these filters together, right? You basically like, you know, uh, um, um, it reside, uh, like coming up with some output at the end of the day, which mathematically make, would make sense. Of course, we did it for our case as well. So we looked at to, uh, the, the different filters and uh, here we looked at different layers, right? And, and compared the original layers to, to our aesthetic layers. <clears throat> and here can, you can see from mobile net um, in the earlier layers, right? So in the low level features here, um, we didn't really see much differences, right? So if you compare on top the original one uh, and the bottom, the aesthetic one, you can see that there's not a lot of different changes for, uh, for mobile net, right? <clears throat> if you go further in the layers, um, here you can still, I mean, I don't really see much differences. So the filter map, uh, the filter uh, uh, hasn't really changed that much, right? But actually only uh, at the end, you could actually see uh, more changes, right? So here you can see that the la la layer 79, right? So before that was, I think some snakes or here a bird, right? Uh, you can see that the model is is not looking at snakes anymore at bird right but actually at something else of course we cannot describe it some way right because it's not like you know uh deep learning deep learning is still in some way uh, like uh, like a black box model so you can really only describe it in some way like how we would look at but it's similar to a human right a human brain of course will not output you 
like, okay, I look at this middle neuron and the middle neuron tells me uh, exactly what actually my brain was thinking, right? But it's kind of indication. Um, and uh, actually the, the most uh, interesting part was actually the output nodes. So in the output nodes, we also visualize the filters and you can see that, so zero is uh, like, uh, uh, like a bad picture, right? versus nine, which is a very nice image, right? You can see that if you increase like the, like the level of outputs, right? Um, the, 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 the image becomes more abstract and you know, more colorful and more details, right? So like an image which get an eight or nine would have much more details in the image, right? Of course, you cannot tell from, from the output now, okay, uh, wow, we, ha we now have to put an image 40% of an angle like from the bedroom so it looks perfect, but this is an indication, okay, the model is actually, you know, going in the right direction, right? So it means like, for, uh, for example, an image which is not really looking it is, is like plain, right? It's boring, you know, and it's, it doesn't have many objects in there. That's an interesting thing that um, it, it, maybe it's, it, do you think we can general, generalize that as a learning uh, about aesthetics? that images with higher or detail might be more attractive? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a I had some um, actually research ideas where I actually wanted to have a master's student or a PhD student actually on that, um, because there are many studies on, on uh, aesthetic, right? And yeah. uh, finding a score for that, you know, and also looking at this, you know, you can find some generalization on top of this as well, right? But I, as I said, uh, beauty or aesthetic is very is very subjective, right? So you know, in in Germany or in Europe, you have a much different like uh, like uh, evaluation of 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 subjectiveness for aesthetic than, for example, people in Japan or in Asia or in the U.S., right? So uh, I think what can happen, what we can do is, uh, if when we're creating these models, it's actually only a snapshot of the current time and the current location, you know, for these people, right? And also based on the data set or based on the people that we basically ask, you know, survey. Because um, as I said, when we did the second iteration, um, we basically, it's a subjective model, you know, as uh, based on the input of Idealo travel people, right? So it means like Idealo people, when we look into data, um, like, you know, in the, in the images, you know, uh, we, for example, like bedroom, like over bathroom or something like this, right? So this is the bias that we put actually into the data. Uh, I was thinking of because uh, you, you know Tinder and those kind of things. So mm -hmm. the basic idea when, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg started with Facebook, I uh, was comparing pictures. Yeah. Stuff. So uh, giving that Idealo has a huge platform, not only with a lot of um, images, but also with a lot of users. Uh, another way to touch on performance of aesthetics could just be taking the clicks and using machine learning uh, to understand where, where people actually click more with some kind of A-B testing. So this is a completely different approach, right? Uh, to really think about aesthetics in, in the picture yeah. uh, instead of just behavioral targeting, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, a picture uh, tells thousand, like a picture is very important, right? Yeah. So uh, if if you if you are if you're an e-commerce right Amazon and something you know the picture is one of the most uh, one of the most important factors when you buy something right yeah. so uh, basically what we created can be applied to many many different many problems right even for you know image galleries you know for like private ones and so on so there's many many uh, use cases where you can use this problem actually apply this problem interesting yeah thank you sorry. Okay, um, um, I think this is almost at the end. So we, uh, of course, uh, a, mach a machine learning model that is on PowerPoint is not really nice. So <laughs> this is not really nice, right? What are we doing now? But of course, a model that is in production uh, has some uh, use, right? And of course, we put it in production. We at that time we used OpenShift to do that. So it was our own internal cluster, and um, it was really cool because. Uh, for Idealo, it was also new how to use Kubernetes and basically like a managed uh, cluster. And uh, the data science team was actually one of the first users who spin up 100 containers at the time, right? Basically to to do the prediction on the 300 million images in two weeks, right? So, I mean, that, that project is now almost five years or something old now. And at that time, you know, it was really, really nice because we were one of the 
the first people who had actually did machine learning at scale, right, in Germany. Um, and of course, um, we created this model, and, you know, and we did this split into uh, train and test, right? But uh, how would it, you know, look like when you know, when you do it on 300 million images, right? Uh, of course, you know, it could be a lot of things that go wrong, right? So, for example, we put it on the 300 million images, and it would give us like every rating would be five, right? <laughs> then we would look like, okay, wow, we created this model, but it didn't really work. Of course, what we did is we we tried to get a sense of these images. So we did a distribution of scores. Here's, we just plotted 1 million as samples. And you can see, ah, cool, the model is actually, you know, having like scores with one, have more, have images with score nine, right? And also images between four to six, so on, right? So it's it's nice, right? It's not like, you know, it's only predicting five. Then of course we took some you know samples from there. You know you cannot look at 300 million images, but just samples, and you can see okay this is low scores. And if you look at this, that's a really low scores, right? For me, so <clears throat> that that uh, the model did pretty pretty good job on that. <clears throat> and if you look at middle scores, it's also pretty good, right? So these images are also not really good looking. Um, but the most important thing, and actually what we uh, hope for was actually for the high scores, right? So if you look at the high scores, these images look really, really good now, right? And uh, and the and the scores make sense for us, right? So if you, for example, let's say, have a business logic, show only pictures that are higher than seven, you know, that's really nice, right? This, this is something where we, you know, want to give our users that user experience. Um, and the cool thing is, it's as I said, it's, uh, it's live on Idealo. So every image that you can see now on Idealo uh, doesn't use you know the old logic anymore. So it used the, the machine learning uh, model there, you know, uh, with the uh, categories classification as as well the as aesthetic, right? Um, so the first image is, is powered by machine learning, and also the image gallery is also powered by machine learning. Cool. Let's uh, go shortly to the conclusion. So as I said, um, so collecting high level data uh, was key to our problem. So as I said. You know, machine learning is, is not super magic in a way that, you know, you come in, use some kind of library or, you know, deep learning, and then you hope that your model will find it. But actually, you know, it's a typical, like, you know, a mathematical statistical problem in some way, right? So you need the right data to model this. Um, in our case, we, Earth Mover Distance was a much better choice than cross entropy loss because we had ordered labels, right? Um, and then, of course, I showed you that you have this trade-off between performance and accuracy uh, when dealing with huge amount of data. So uh, it's very important, you know, that you, um, you know, don't stick to one big model like VG16 uh, or ResNet or something because it's better. But uh, you know, in production system, it's also very, very important, you know, to choose the right model. Of course, sometimes the performance is less, right? But then uh, the accuracy is less. But then you have a faster performance in terms of predicting it, right? Um, if you want to understand more about the project, so we, we had a chance to blog on this on the developer, uh, NVIDIA's developer blog. So we put a lot of details on there, right? Um, and also we um, wrote a blog post on our own um, uh, pub publication as well. The both links are still valid, right? Yeah, they are still valid. So. <clears throat> awesome. Cool. Okay. Uh, this is a link for the uh, GitHub project. So if you uh, have a look at this, um, it is actually not really nice code anymore because at that time, you know, we we only uh, put it in a way so that you have a have a Docker file for that. But it's uh, basically if you use AWS, right, and you have the um, access to the AVR and TID data set, uh, then you can actually train the model. As I said, we we not only train the aesthetic model, but we also train the technical model, right? And basically, uh, we also provide the uh, pre-trained models as well, right? But only, of course, they are public. So we don't, we didn't provide the the Idealo trained model because this is uh, our pro pro uh, proprietary model, of course, right? So, okay. Of course, uh, I was not alone in this project. Uh, in fact, I only led the project. Uh, I think most of the contributions should go to the team who actually work on that project, uh, especially Christopher Lennon and Hao Nguyen. Um, they are still at Idealo and they um, still maintaining this project. And I'm also maintaining this project, but uh, um, they mainly work on that as well from the code base. Um, and I'm mainly also from the, I, I was mainly 
uh, doing this conceptually, but also uh, work on some of the code as well. All right, so coming to the end of the, uh, of the presentation, I hope you liked it. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, there are questions. Let's, uh, and I'll allow you to, to speak up uh, yourself. You can ask the questions directly yeah. if you like. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Hello, you, you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice presentation. It was uh, really interesting to, to see also the basic details. I think it was quite clear. And of course, very interesting to, to play with uh, CNNs. Uh, I, I thought about a few questions. Uh, you, you didn't say about the technical quality of the images. Mm -hmm. uh, did you use it uh, for the final ordering? Uh, wh what did you use and uh, how did you combine with the aesthetic uh, quality? Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, I cannot, this part I cannot go too much in the details because it's business logic, right? <laughs> so, uh, of, we also um, use the technical quality, uh, but for the technical quality, we had to do a lot of, you know, uh, creating synthetic data, like all case, because technical quality is very, very challenging, you know, because uh, the problem with technical quality is um, you have to design the experiment very well when you're collecting the data, because if you show a filter, right, different people will really, you know, give very, very different different settings right and in order to mitigate this we actually created our own data set based on some random distribution um with some uh, disturbance right and basically uh, created a synthetic data set on that did it answer your question uh yeah i think so yeah i just thought this also plays a big role in the perception of the, of the image right yes of course i mean i mean um the technical quality is easier to solve, right? So, for example, an image which uh, looks uh, less better, like from the color, like uh, from from blurness and and uh, color and and you know brightness and so on, is something that you know you can uh, order this uh, like differently as well, right? And and basically the business logic is, I mean, uh, uh, not not going too deeper into details, right? Um, what could what what happen is you know you 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 have a aesthetic score as a ranking, right? As a rule first, then you have a te technical order, right? And then you also have like, you know, different orders that is provided by, by, by Idealo itself, right? So this is something that you could do the business logic and different, different companies will probably choose a different uh, logic as well, right? Okay, okay, I see, thanks. Thank you, thanks for the question. Uh, I think, um, so you, you have been basically asked, um, answering everything which uh, someone would probably ask in your presentation. So that was uh, pretty much uh, a very focused on what you've been talking that. I like it. I liked uh, the presentation. Um, so if there's no further question, I, I would say just thank you because you took so long time and spent uh, this evening with us talking in so much detail. That was awesome. Uh, one thing just organizational again, this presentation you sent me the PDF so I can share it with the community. Uh, yeah, I can send the uh, um, um, PDF. PDF, that would be awesome. Uh, we're going to, we had recorded the session again, like like yesterday. And uh, because you just mentioned the labeling is a, a major part of uh, the whole model building, basically. Uh, we will have a special session on labeling on February the 3rd. Uh, um, Toluca will be with us. So look at mm -hmm. uh, that unit was actually working for Yandex. So, so to say the Russian Google uh, doing all the, the labeling stuff. And I think we get a lot of insights from labeling and how to increase the quality and such things. Uh, thanks again, Dad, for, for that evening. And thanks again, all of those guys uh, who joined us today. Thanks for being with us and hope to see you again next week. Uh, have a nice evening and stay safe, please. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.